Well, when I was about 13 or 14, I had the chance to shadow um, a physician called an anesthesiologist. You know, the physicians that put people to sleep, keep them alive during surgery, and I thought it was amazing. And ever since then, I wanted to be an anesthesiologist, and I am now an anesthesiologist. So, yeah. so at the age of 14, you saw it, or mm -hmm. you actually... Oh, I didn't do it. No, I, I watched the doctor do it. So oh. I, was, I was there shadowing him. So um, essentially just observing, you know, and watching and seeing what they did and some of the cool things that they got to do. And um, when I was um, in medical school, it just solidified that, you know, going in to see the, the cool heart surgeries and brain surgeries and, and all that kind of thing. It, it, was, uh, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Then, what kind of children you, what kind of children do you want to say that they might try to think of being a surgeon? So, like, like what, what would I um, suggest they, they do to, to try and become a surgeon, or? Oh, sorry. What kind okay. of kids should think of being a surgeon? Well, anybody who, um, really enjoy science so people who enjoy math you know along with that skill set even people who enjoy you know robotics you know because even there are surgeons at this point that are using robotic type of uh, um, machines to help perform surgery so anybody who has interest in, in those fields they could they could become a surgeon and somebody who's good at their hands as well so so you have, you're now a doctor, mm -hmm. and you have to study a lot, I don't yes. know. So, do you, have you had any challenges while studying for a doctor? Well, absolutely, you know. There, there are many things that, um, even during medical school, that you'll never get the depth of knowledge that you would, you would get until you go there. I mean, you can study as hard as you can in, in college, but medical school is there for a reason it's very difficult but um learning the the human body the more you learn about it the more you learn we don't know everything about it at the same time so we have to be able to adapt the knowledge that we have and apply it and try and push and find new things about the human body that we can help Well, there are many different types of surgeries, and so I, I am a specialist that I, I work on um, interventional pain. So people who have chronic pain issues who have had previous back surgery, um, I do a very specific type of surgery that puts almost like a little computer into their spinal cord that helps reprogram it so they're not, not feeling anywhere near as much pain as they did before. So that, that's my particular specialty within medicine so so you're not just any doctor you're a specialist yes you, yes. you only do the putting in the chip yes yeah, so I, I do i do that um i do various types of injections on the spine um but if if, if anybody has pain in anywhere throughout the body on a, on a consistent basis i i find ways to treat that so not only do I put little computer chips in the back, I, I put them over a lot of different nerves in the body as well. You know, as the nerve endings send signals to the spinal cord, sometimes the spinal cord can't change it. 
So a change hit the level below the node. You can't tell what what's wrong wrong to them particularly. So they're fine and certain, but that's because of that's from when they're born. Oh, so, so trying to tell the difference whether something is what what we call congenital, where they're born with it, that it's very rare to have a pain syndrome just to be born with that. I mean, that'd be awful. But um, most of the time, the patients that I see are typically adults and typically who have had some sort of injury. But, th th but at the same time, as we get older, we develop aches and pains and, and in different places in your knees and your joints, particularly in your back. But to help understand exactly what's going on, I get x-rays, I get an MRI, sometimes a CT scan, all these pictures of their body to see inside. And so I, I look at what's going on inside from an anatomy standpoint, but I also examine the patient and probe and prod and make them move a little bit and try and find out exactly where their pain is coming from. If they move a, a specific way um, with their back, for example, if they're leaning forward, then I'm thinking, oh, it might be the front of their spine, right? If they're leaning backward and that hurts their, that hurts more that way, then it could be hurt, hurting the small joints of the low back. So it, it's, a, it's a very, I guess, difficult process to, to understand exactly where the pain is coming from sometimes, but we do have a lot of different tools to help us. Then have you ever thought, so, Farmers, I can't understand. Well, you haven't met any patients who was born with this condition. Very, very rare. And I, I luckily have never seen a patient who was born with with those pains. There are some conditions that can um, predispose someone to pain. You know, so um, not not everybody has the same number of vertebrae in their back. You know, some people have six lumbar vertebrae instead of the normal five. And that can make the joints uh, wear out faster, you know, in some individuals. But most of the time, you know, the good thing is kids don't have to worry about chronic pain too often. Sometimes it happens, but not typically a problem with it. Well, then, have you ever thought of how you will act when later on you found a patient who was poor? Have you ever thought that, of this? That would be a yes. So, there are difficult situations I have to face in, in medicine many times. You know, so whether I can't figure out what's going on with somebody, or if, if somebody is born with a specific painful condition, the best, that, the best at that point we can do if we can't figure out what's going on is obviously speak with the parents and speak with the patient as much as they understand, you know, depending on how old they are. But just show them as much love as you can. You know, that's the easiest thing that I, that I can do. So, what does the Hippocratic Oath mean to you? It means a, a lot. Obviously, we, I, I don't want to harm individuals, right? Mm -hmm. So, if, if I'm aiming to treat patients and help them, you know, the, the worst I could do is, is make things worse, right? So I always take into that into consideration. I talk with each patient, say, mm, before we consider the surgery, here are the risks, here are the potential benefits, and if they agree, and I agree that this is something that we should do, then we move forward. But I never, ever, ever would try to force somebody to do a procedure that I think maybe they need if they are not wanting or willing to go through it. Then what? What will you do if it's the opposite? So you don't think that it might help, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. But the patient thinks that he or she has to. That's an excellent question. So that happens sometimes. Uh, patients will come and, and uh, they'll talk to me about a specific procedure that they've heard of, maybe on TV or on the internet. and. Um, 
I will evaluate them for that particular procedure and see whether or not it's help it would be helpful. You know, in the case for US where it might be helpful, but I, I really don't think they need it, I'll tell them that. You know, and, and the the worst thing that I could do is just do it because they want me to, if I don't feel it's right. Right? Like there's always other individuals if they really want to go after that procedure. There are some doctors that, that may end up doing it for them. But like I say, I'm, I'm, I strive to do only what's necessary for the patients, not what, um, well, conferring with the patients and, and obviously taking their concerns into, into consideration. But I would rather not do something if I don't think it's gonna be very helpful. As a doctor, you are a monitor, reporter. So what would you do if your patient has a pain, mm -hmm. but it seems like it's caused by certain abuse? What would you do? Well, luckily, I've, I've never had to encounter that. But what we are taught is if we are worried about abuse of any kind, obviously that the first thing that I do is, is contact our hospital social worker. And when we, um, when we get them involved, the social worker then evaluates the, the individual. And um, they then, at that point, get law enforcement involved if they need to, other agencies if they need to. Uh, the more frequent thing that I would encounter in an abuse situation would be elder abuse. You know, not so much child abuse because I really don't see many children. But um, that is utilizing a good social worker often helps resolve the issue, but at least brings it to the law enforcement's attention. So that's one of the bigger things that I would deal with. So you said that you were have a social worker. Mm -hmm. So what would you do? After that, so you said you would mostly encounter elder abuse. Mm -hmm. So, what would you do after all the law enforcement are done, but the elderly is suffering? So, I would obviously treat the patient as best that I can, but at the point where we get the social worker involved we as physicians are removed from, from the law enforcement process un, unless we are asked to testify or anything along those lines. So that, that's, it's the social worker's job at that point to help take care of that, that situation. But I'm more than happy to speak with um, like the nursing home supervisor or with the physician who's, take, who's also working with the, the um, the home care facility, or not, not the home care, but the, the uh, I can't remember the name of it. But, uh, you know, so, so the, the retirement home type situation. So if, if it's that kind of situation, or if they have their own home and, and we think maybe it's one of their children that might be abusing them, or um, one of their friends, whoever it be, we try and remove them from that situation as, as, more, as much as we can. But most importantly for me, as, as a specialist, I get the person who's most involved in their care, usually their primary care physician, involved along with the social worker. Okay, so... So, do you have any experience of not from like all of those testing says that the pain is from bad nutrition or other things. What would you advise the patient to do? Well, there's there's not a lot of tests that I that I can run that would show that a pain is, is caused from poor nutrition, right? But the the first and foremost thing that I do when I see a patient is on physical examination, when I'm talking to them, when I'm um, checking out their, their body, making sure that everything's how it should be. Um, if somebody is malnourished, you know, there are many signs, you know, um, things that we don't typically see starvation here in America, but um, there are individuals who just don't eat as well as they should. 
Um, if they're on the thinner side, I counsel with them regarding how much caloric intake they have, um, whether or not they're actually getting protein, whether they're getting enough fat, whether they're getting enough carbohydrates. We, we talk about the basics, right? Because a lot of times, individuals that I would see that um, may not be getting the, the right nourishment might be taking most of the calories in with alcohol, for example. And so we want to help them understand, like, look, we need to make a change here. But the opposite is also true. Those individuals who may have excessive calories and, and um, are very much overweight, which could be causing their joints to erode and causing a lot of pressure in different areas, causing more pain. Then I have to counsel with them as well. Like, look, this may or may not be your fault. This might be genetics, but all the same, we need to work on how to improve your diet in order to um, help you help yourself. Right? So we still got to be delicate about it. We can't just walk up to someone and say, you know, you're, you're too fat for me to treat. We can't say that. And nor would I want to think that. Being a physician is about helping and, and finding a way to kindly assist someone in a dire situation. So, how are you treating an emergency mm -hmm. coming up to you? when you're consulting another patient. So while you're doing, while you're consulting a patient, mm -hmm. an emergency arrives, and the only thing that can save it is you. What, what would you do? Well, I, I would tell the patient that I'm sitting with, say, look, I am so sorry. There is an, an, an emergent situation that I need to deal with right now. Would you mind if I go take care of that and I'll give you the attention you need afterwards? And um, hopefully, you know, they, they would say, oh, by all means, you know, I've, I've had a couple of those where patients have come in from um, home from a surgery that I've done or an injection that I performed or um, were sent in from another physician that they wanted me to look at rapidly. And every time that I've said that to my patients, they've fully supported that and waited for me. Or they said, well, I gotta go, but I'll reschedule one. So I, I don't charge them for that visit, have them come back and, and uh, reestablish them again. So. so this might be a little bit hard, but what would you do if you had a surgery mm -hmm. right now, you're doing it, but then there's an emergency and they need you right now? Mm -hmm. What would you do? Well, in that very hypothetical situation, you know, because I, I will have many people that could help me, um, I would assess the, the, the patient that I'm doing surgery on, decide whether or not it's something that I can just stabilize for the moment, and if it was a true emergency that they needed me for, by all means, leave the patient who has who is in surgery with um, a physician's assistant or another surgeon come in and watch the patient talk with the anesthesiologist who's monitoring the patient and with the room, make sure they know the plan and that I am available to be, uh, to come back if there's something else going on. Because obviously my first concern is the fact that I'm doing surgery on somebody. But if there's a true emergency where they need me, you know, if the patient is stable enough on the table, by all means, I can, I can break scrub, go help with that other one, and then come back in and finish, you know, if the patient is stable. So, but if the patient's unstable here, two unstable patients, I, got, I need to work on the one that I'm currently working on. So that's a tough situation. So, was there any... Was there any kind of stress when you got while the, in the first of the COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. so you couldn't open the hospital for a long time? Or? Well, it affected my practice a little bit, but the, uh, we, basically I was still seeing patients in clinic. We had contact precautions, using masks, and, and, and that kind of thing, but 
um, we would screen each patient and tell them, look, if you have any cold type symptoms or anything like that, or flu like symptoms, let's get you rescheduled. But um, with me being a very kind of niche specialist, um, the, the COVID pandemic didn't affect my practice as much. What, what it did affect is for the first two months, while we were striving to understand how this virus was working and how it would be transmitted and how it would be affecting the hospital, we avoided taking patients to the hospital for what we would call elective procedures. So um, anything that wasn't emergent, then we would hold off until after we figured out what our protocol would be for treatment or prevention of COVID transmission. So, but we, it, it, I probably did about 20% as much of the surgeries and, and uh, injections as I normally do, but that's okay. We wanted to make sure that we were maintaining as much safety for the patients as possible. Okay. So, you said in your hospital there wasn't as much as effect of COVID-19, correct? Well, in my practice. Yes. So, not, not my hospital. You know, the hospital um, is, is all of the different specialists and, and uh, um, the emergency room, et cetera. They, you know, that, that's separate from my personal practice. But, um, yeah, the hospital was affected. You know, you, you could tell um, all of the nurses and all of the um, doctors in the ER and in the, um, the medicine floors in the hospital were being very cautious. They were wearing the N95 masks, you know, to try and prevent transmission. Um, frequent, frequent, frequent hand washing and um, making sure we didn't touch our faces and eyes and, and uh, not touching anything um, and then touching the patient. Being very careful about that. Okay. So, what was a surgery or a consultation that was most the most memorable? So, such as you sur you did a surgery to somebody and he or she now felt no pain. So it, it, it happens um, more than you would think, you know. In fact, yesterday I had an individual who had been suffering for pain for three weeks and was told by the ER, told by their primary doctor that it was one thing, that they thought they had a big pinched nerve in their back. And so they had an MRI, um, they had some x-rays done, and it looked like there might have been something there. So they, they sent them to me because they just weren't getting better. And I assessed the patient and it turned out that it wasn't even, it wasn't a pinched nerve, it was something else. And so I took them back to the operating room and we did a, a quick injection and, and with, guided by x-ray into their, what we call sacral iliac joint, you know, right at the, kind of the, the base of the buttock and back area. Mm -hmm. And as soon, right after we did the injection, the patient got up off the table and had no pain whatsoever. And he was suffering for three weeks. So he ran up and gave me a big hug, and you know, I tried to hug him back best I could, you know, and, uh, um, but he, was, he did very well. But one of the most memorable cases was um, a younger um, individual, she was 27 at the time, who developed a very rare case of pain that is called complex regional pain syndrome. And she couldn't walk um, on her leg, it hurt so much. And she had been to multiple orthopedic surgeons, trying to figure out what was going, what's going on with her, her knee and her ankle. Um, finally, the one of the orthopedic surgeons that I worked with, uh, he came and he said, "Look, we can't figure this out. Why don't you see this patient?" And so I, I went and talked to her, and we figured it out. And then um, once we had the the diagnosis, we went through the process of her insurance allowing us to do. What, one of those spinal cord stimulators, you know, with those electric oh. computer type things you put in her spine. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so we completely erased her pain and she was walking without crutches and without any issues after we did the surgery. So it was amazing. So definitely it was life changing for her. And 
you know, and it's it's definitely a privilege and why I, I love doing this and to be able to help patients like you. Okay, so some people will then think there is a step in life, so it's revival. Mm -hmm. So if you have another life to live, then what career will you choose? That's a tough one. I really like what I do now. But, you know, that I knowing what I know now, I, I would I might go about it a different way. And um I, I I probably would still go into medicine, but um there are many different paths to getting there. The way that I took was um I took business courses in, in, in college and graduated with a business degree. Um I probably would go go back and prepare for law school, and I would do law school followed by medical school. Mm -hmm. So if I did that, there are many ways that I can, I would be able to help healthcare in general, not just not just patients alone, but um, you know because there, there are many things that are going on with medicine that are corruption and um, exploitation of. Uh, insurances and, and, and uh, as well as the, the people who actually perform the work, you know, the doctors, nurses, and, and uh, um, the physician extenders, you know, that kind of thing. So if I could work with both the law as well as medicine to try and bring those two together and improve healthcare, that would be an amazing career. I would love that. So you told me about another doctor, mm -hmm. house, then how, what would you do instead of a doctor? Oh, so, so what would I do if I, if I wasn't a doctor? Mm -hmm. Like, what job would you get mm -hmm. instead of a doctor next life? Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, this law would, would be interesting, but... Uh, um, I have interest in many different things. If I was being purely selfish um, and just to just focus on fun, um, honestly, I, I, I love skiing. I love mountain biking. I love being in the outdoors. Um, if, if I could find a way to inter integrate that into um, providing individuals experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have, maybe do some... Uh, um, Maybe I would have become a little bit more proficient in skiing and that kind of thing when I was younger to be able to um, create something like a, like a snow park or something like that or training facilities that people could use not just in the winter, but something they could, they could use in the, in the summertime as well um, and you know, focus on that. You know, it would be, it'd be a lot of fun to, to do more physical and outdoor type of work. Okay. So do you have any do you have any thoughts about COVID nineteen, how it affected your holistic life? Well sure. Well I luckily, um, you know, if I ever did get COVID nineteen, maybe I, I was never very sick during the pandemic. Um, my wife, she had COVID-19 and it affected her taste for a couple of weeks. It was very interesting. But life in general, um, it has definitely made the population more aware of disease processes and disease spreading, you know, in America, hand washing and, and uh, um, being careful about transmission of disease really wasn't a priority until more recently. Now, the, the, the effect on my life personally, um, it's, that, that's a, a very complex question because, I, because of the changes that we instituted in COVID, it made me realize that I needed to find a different location to work um, rather than the hospital that I was with before. And recently, I just changed to a private practice situation rather than working for the hospital. Um, and that, that's because of the changes with COVID, it brought to light a lot of the things that the hospital was trying to 
forced me to do for patients that I didn't think was ethical. So because of that, it's it's kind of turned me in the right direction. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be um, starting a new practice and being away from my previous hospital um, so I can focus on treating patients how they need to be treated rather than how the administration wants me to be treated. So it's a kind of a different way that COVID affected me personally, but you know, I'm definitely seeing that in a positive way. Okay, so is there any program or or you can you could do for engaging or with programs you might what kind of programs you might do to make awareness of the COVID-19 disease for children? For children? Well, that's, that's a very good question. Um, COVID-19 is very much well known at this point, but to educate individuals or young people about COVID-19, um, I haven't really thought about that much, but just this if if um, if you had nurses, if you had physicians, um, go and speak to classes or teach a little um, kind of interactive course on on how viruses work, I think it'd be very interesting. You know, because if if you're telling the kids just to wash their hands and don't touch their face, um, it's 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 really not going to be very effective. But if you teach them what the danger is, teach them what the, the process is biologically, then I think they then tell them, oh, here's the danger. This is how we avoid it, and this is how we can prevent it. And then I think they'd be more accepting on, and less, less uh, fighting us on, how, on washing hands and even wearing masks. You know? Whether or not masks are completely effective, it still um, has it can have significant effects, but you know, a lot of kids don't want to wear them. You know, um, if they're sick, more kids are more willing to wear masks to avoid transmission. Whereas before, you know, they'd sneeze in the middle of anywhere, cough anywhere, and then now they're coughing in their elbows and you know wearing masks like they should. So again, if we, if we educate them on what the what COVID nineteen actually is, then then follow up with prevention would be. So the way you thought of it is pretty good, but what I'm concerning is smaller kids, mm -hmm. it might be harder, so this time, just think of your explaining that to kids. Okay, so for kindergartners, well, if, if you go in and uh, bring in visual aids, for example, maybe a ball full of spikes on it, that kind of looks like what a virus is, and if you if you go in and you know I'm just thinking off the top of my head here, but you say, well, guys, let's play some catch, and then they all run around in a, a more more of a dodgeball situation, and they, every time they get hit with the ball, they have to be out; they can't play. It's like, well, you just got you just got struck with COVID. You just got struck with COVID, and so the more they understand that, like, oh, well. So then I come back and say, well, this ball is a virus, and it can be transmitted, and it can cause you to be out, you know, and so make you feel sick, and that might be a fun interactive way to help them understand that, yeah, well, you're sure this is a this can be a problem. So if you started out with something that grabs their attention, that you can bring it back into um, an educational experience. I think that would be most effective for kindergarten. It would be fun. Right? Let's so give the teacher we... permission first. <laughs> so the last one is... So from till now, we only talk about just in utensils for somebody, but what do you think you might do for yourself? To, uh, for 
for, like to educate myself about COVID or for them? For what? what? Okay. So if, if I am, um, obviously, you know, the, the, I've signed up for alerts from the Centers for Disease Control, National Institute of Health, um, that come in my inbox. Um, so I, I, I try and stay up on that information and read any new information that comes out. Um, so I can at least be aware of, of, of COVID-19. But once again, you know, with, with my practice, I luckily don't have to treat it. But all the same, for, for me to, you know, I'll continue to wear masks with patient encounters. I'll continue to frequently wash my hands, um, screen patients before they come into the clinic to make sure that they're not sitting there in a crowded waiting room if they're sick, you know. And if they're sick, we just gotta reschedule, you know. So those kinds of stops um, can help prevent me from getting the disease, but as well as protect my patients from getting it. Hopefully that answers your question. It does. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll you know, see ya. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, I appreciate all the questions. They're very insightful. Thank you for answering the questions I gave you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. You good?